A ruthless grab for power tears a city apart. A crime family splits in two as the young and the old fight to the death. The FBI is caught in the middle as they infiltrate the syndicate in a desperate attempt to end the brutal war raging on the streets of Philadelphia. In the 1990s, Philadelphia became the scene of a bloody vendetta. The streets erupted in mob warfare. Authorities feared innocent people would be caught in the crossfire. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents launched a complex and risky surveillance operation. Their mission? To bring down a notorious crime family and to stop a brutal turf war before more people were killed. nineteen ninety a quiet morning in south philadelphia pennsylvania joe andruzzi is being wired by the fbi he's a twenty-year-old accounting student at la salle university and he's in trouble he's been betting on football through a mafia bookmaker he was winning at first but his luck turned sour he owes the mob one thousand dollars It's a debt he cannot pay. You understand? I don't think you do, son. I don't think you got it at all. But you understand what's going on here. In way I'm over his head and afraid for his life, Andruzzi contacted the FBI and asked for help. Get the money, kid. South Philly is a tough place. Not the kind of place where you want to cross the mob. La Cosa Nostra, the Italian syndicate of organized crime families, runs a profitable and bloody business there. Gambling, loan sharking, and extortion rackets. For years, South Philly was run by Angelo Bruno, known as the Gentle Don because of his dislike of violence. He took over the city in the 1950s. He was brutally murdered in 1980. The man suspected of being behind the hit was Nicodemo Scarfo. Nicky Scarfo took over Bruno's empire. He was a cold-hearted killer who ruled the city by violence. But now Nicky Scarfo is in jail. The FBI wants to find out who is running the Philadelphia mob while the boss is behind bars. Andruzzi's problem with the loan shark gives the FBI the perfect opportunity to collect new information on the organization. The college student meets with the bookmaker. He plays his part perfectly and is introduced to Salvatore Sparaccio, a known member of the Philadelphia Mafia. I don't have the money. You don't have the money. FBI Special Agent Jim Marr was the case agent on this investigation. Salvatore Sparaccio didn't make any overt threats, but the implied threat, I'm the boss of the family, you gotta pay. I want $120 a week for 10 weeks. The boss offers a repayment plan. Although the mob is charging little more interest than a credit card company, the penalty for defaulting on the loan has a far higher price. Nicky, here, take some cake off to your wife. Hey, thanks, Bob. For the next 10 weeks, the FBI gives Andruzzi the money to make his payments. And each time he takes the money to the bookmaker, the FBI records the conversation, building their case against Salvatore Sparaccio. Each payment is evidence of, of the crime, of racketeering. But the FBI is not interested in making low-level gambling arrests. 
Are we going, huh? They have a much bigger target. I'm sure it's all there. The ultimate goal is to destroy the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family as a crime problem. The tactics we use are to attack the hierarchy. The, 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 structure, the, the structure is the, is the target, and we, we attack the target through, through the hierarchy. They need more information. So on Christmas Day, when they know it will be closed, the FBI breaks into the bakery shop. We proved to the judge that gambling activity and loan sharking activity was taking place in an Italian bakery. The judge authorized us to put microphones in. For the next several months, the FBI records the conversations inside the bakery. And we began listening to conversations of Salvatore Sparaccio, who was claiming to be the boss of the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family. Although Spiraccio claims to be the head of the family, the FBI wire soon makes it clear that Spiraccio is not one of the big Philadelphia Mafia bosses. He is little more than an employee, but the FBI doesn't know who he's working for. Thinking he can lead them to his boss, the FBI surveillance tracks Spiraccio to a law office in Camden, New Jersey. There he meets with other members of the Philadelphia Mafia, including one man well known to the FBI, John Stanfa. John Stanfa is a Sicilian immigrant and a made member of the Sicilian Mafia. He worked as a driver for the late Angelo Bruno, AKA the Gentle Don, former head of the Philadelphia family. Stanford was implicated in the murder of the former mafia boss in 1981 and was apprehended in Maryland. He was convicted of perjury in his testimony before a grand jury that was probing Bruno's death. He went to jail for eight years. When he was released, the Philadelphia Mafia put out a contract on his life for the killing of Bruno. Special Agent Fred Walsh is a member of the FBI's organized crime squad. Only through the intercession of his Gambino uh, associates up in New York, uh, the contract was taken off him and he was allowed to live. After Nicky Scarfo went to jail, Stanford returned to Philadelphia. He went to work in the construction business and laid low for a while. He was relatively quiet. So when he started to come to power and we started to notice he was making a name for himself, it came as a kind of a surprise to us. Thanks to the cooperation of the young college student, the FBI has now identified the man they believe is running organized crime in Philadelphia. We had put away the previous boss and most of the hierarchy of the family. We felt if we could put Stanford away, that we would go a long way towards the ultimate goal of, of eliminating the crime, the uh, Philadelphia family as a crime problem. On the street, informants confirm the FBI suspicion that John Stanford is the new boss of the Philadelphia Mafia. Once you determine that an individual like Stanford is taking the family over, you want to see how he intends to run it. You uh, contact your informants, see what they can provide, Stanford maintains a low profile. He runs things like the Gentle Don before him. He engages in traditional mob activities such as loan sharking, gambling, and extortion. The FBI wants to find out where he is conducting business. According to FBI informants, high-level secret mafia meetings are being held in the lawyer's conference room. Informants uh, told us that that's where they were meeting, that they felt secure there. Uh, since it was a lawyer's office, they felt secure there from FBI eavesdropping. We decided that it would be a very, very good place uh, to put microphones. Agents prepare an affidavit to wire the premises. We recognize that intruding into a lawyer's office was extraordinary. The affidavit had to go down to the FBI headquarters. The director of the FBI personally signed off on it. A federal judge gives the FBI the green light. 
Agents install a hidden video camera outside the law office so they can monitor anyone who enters or leaves the building. How about now? A special FBI entry unit will install a hidden microphone inside the law offices. Agents make a surreptitious entry into the second floor suite. In terms of, uh, of the actual entry into the premises, it's what I regard to be one of the most dangerous things the FBI does because you're, you're, you're burglarizing someone else's property. Although you have authority to be there, the person, if you, if you encounter someone, he doesn't know that you have authority to be there. Inside, the agents fear they've been discovered. An armed deputy sheriff is inside the building. The night before we went in, the uh, re-elect the sheriff campaign moved into the ground floor. The agents making the entry were surprised by a deputy sheriff. Fortunately, uh, they were able to conceal themselves. He got in and got out before there was any problem. Technicians install a microphone in the conference room. The surveillance agents will first try to identify each suspect and determine their roles in the organization. There's 18 FBI agents who do nothing but physical and photographic and video surveillances. Most of their work they did for the organized crime squad. So we've got a lot of manpower out there, and we've got people who, who know how La Cosa Nostra works. And we can a lot of times figure out a hierarchy just by watching the way that they behave towards one another. That coupled with information coming from informants can tell us who the hierarchy is. Agents monitoring the conversations have to match the voice on the wire to the face in the video surveillance. John Stanford was very easy. He had a very heavy Italian accent. Uh, so it was very easy to figure out uh, when he was speaking. But the agents have a problem. The conversations we intercepted in the office indicated to us that they were uh, leaving the conference room and going somewhere. After going to all the trouble to plant the wire, the mob boss moves the meetings. The surveillance agents will have to find out where the meetings are now taking place. They will have to place another bug. They're gone. They're somewhere else. A few days later, the FBI learns from an informant that a high-level sit-down is about to take place at the law office between John Stanfa and several associates. They need to get the new bug in place before the meeting. But they don't know where the meeting will be held. Agents dispatch an undercover detective to follow Stanfa into the office. Philadelphia detective Mark Panero gets the job. We try to come up with a reason to actually go into the law firm to get a, a closer look at what was going on. So we had come up with a cover story uh, utilizing a, a name of an attorney that we knew had left that firm. But it does not go exactly as planned. So this uh, unknown individual held the door for me to go in first, which kind of set me back because I wanted to go in second. I want to see where they they were going before I was attended to. But I was relieved when I walked in and the receptionist greeted John Stanfa and John Stanfa told her, let him know I'm here. And uh, the receptionist immediately keyed her uh, intercom and let the lead attorney of this law firm know that John was there and to send him in. So not only was I able to get her to identify John Stanfa, I was able to stand there and watch him go down to the actual office of this lead attorney at uh, this law firm. That's good. That's real good. Okay, lock it on. Thanks. With this information, a federal court approves an affidavit for a second break-in at the office. Agents install hidden microphones in the attorney's office.
Shortly after the new bugs are placed, agents hear some alarming news on the wire. The mob bosses are afraid they are being watched. They hire a private counter-surveillance contractor to sweep the law offices for bugs. If he finds a listening device, the entire operation could be destroyed. The FBI in Philadelphia is closing in on mob boss John Stanfa. They learn he is conducting mob business in an attorney's office. Agents place listening devices in the office, but Stanford calls in a man to sweep for bugs. Agents watch as the sweeper enters the building. Their entire case could collapse if he finds their bugs. Here they come. But after a few tense minutes, the private contractor completes his sweep without finding anything. It sort of brought a smile to everybody's face because uh, they basically brought in an expert who didn't detect anything. So that would bring a sort of a feeling of ease on their part. And uh, I guess our expectations were that they would be even more at ease to discuss further criminal activity. Now with microphones in the conference room and the lawyer's private office, the information begins to come in. The FBI learns that John Stanford is having problems with a group of young mobsters. Born and raised in South Philly, their allegiance is still with Nicky Scarfo and the Mafia regime before Stanford took over. They are known as the Young Turks. As far as they're concerned, Philadelphia is and always has been their turf. And the Young Turks deserve to be running the crime family, not newcomer John Stanfa. Joey Merlino is the boss of the Young Turks. Michael Changlini is the number two man. Joey and Michael have known each other since grade school. FBI Special Agent Gary Langan is the co-case agent. They didn't like the fact that John Stanford, who what they considered an outsider, would come in and take over the mob family. And so they were trying to organize their own little group, even though they were part of the overall picture. And they wanted to be in charge. Informants tell the FBI that the Young Turks are not taking orders from John Stanford. They bragged about the, who they were and who they were aligned with. Bragged about how they were going to take the city over. They were the legitimate successors to the previous mob members under Nicky Scarfa. They were going out and shaking down um, bookmakers, drug dealers, uh, and even in shaking down legitimate businesses, and uh, weren't sharing the profits, to, you know, kicking upstairs to Stanfa. The Young Turks feel they're entitled to run the city and the Philadelphia Mafia. The aging John Stanfa, the old world Sicilian boss, resents the ostentatious lifestyle of the Young Turks. The Young Turks, if you will, were very, very uh, flamboyant. They'd go into the clubs on Delaware Avenue, throw their weight around, push people around, uh, trade on the fact that they were connected to the local Cosa Nostra family, and in general call attention to themselves, uh, which is not a good thing. If you're running a Cosa Nostra family, you should be low key. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, girls, get in the car. Jay, come on, get out of here. Start it up, start it up. You got it. The young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, has a different idea of how a Cosa Nostra boss should live the life. He was the kind of guy who felt that when he went into a restaurant, because of who he was, he shouldn't have to pay. Uh, this was easily adopted by his entourage, and they became a problem for everybody. There, there, was, there were fights, there were shootings, there were... Uh, it's just not the way to run a Cosa Nostra family. Uh, attracting all that attention to yourself, uh, 
the police begin to know then where you are and uh, who you are, and it's just not a good thing. John Stanford was particularly angered by the Young Turks' involvement in the sale of illegal narcotics. That was the wave of the future, and it's an easy way to make money. Um, traditionally, the mob uh, frowns upon uh, having its members engage in drug dealing. Now, that, that's not to say that they, they don't do it. They get around that by uh, having an associate or something uh, deal drugs, and then they'll tax that individual and take a percentage of it. But Stanford, you know, he thought drugs were a dirty business, and it draws a lot of attention, again, to the family. And uh, he didn't want to do that. And these guys were just uh, defying him and doing it. Once we heard that there was friction developing, we were looking to see how Stanford was going to handle it. Okay, was he going to be aggressive and, uh, you know, take extreme measures? Or was he going to try and uh, mollify these people and uh, quiet them down and get them under his uh, uh, wing, so to speak? But Joey Merlino isn't going under anyone's wing. The Young Turks strike back at Stanford. 73-year-old Joseph Gatone is one of Mafia boss John Stanford's most loyal employees. Gatone is a bookmaker, a collector of street taxes. Four gunshots shatter the daily routine of Joseph Gatone. The old man's blood marks the beginning of a deadly civil war. The FBI and the Philadelphia Organized Crime Task Force surveilled top bosses of the Philadelphia Mafia. Friction between feuding factions of the crime family increase, and a bloody civil war breaks out. Philadelphia police officers arrive at the scene of the shooting. The victim's keys are still in the ignition, and the engine is still running. Two bullets penetrated the victim's neck. A third bullet entered his temple. A fourth grazed the bridge of his nose and shattered the passenger side window. When Agent Marr arrives on the scene, police have already checked the registration of the car, but they don't yet know who the victim is. Agent Marr recognizes the victim from previous investigations. Gatone is a longtime member of the Philadelphia crime family, currently under the leadership of John Stanford. Several of Gatone's neighbors witnessed the shooting, but no one can identify the lone hooded gunman. Special Agent Jim Marr suspects Joey Merlino's young Turks are behind the killing. Where he was killed, the manner in which he was killed, indicated to me that the Merlino faction was sending a message to Stanford and his people, we're here and we are to be reckoned with. John does. Agents monitor their wiretaps. But no one is talking about the murder. Special Agent Fred Walls. Initially, at the time that uh, this bookmaker was murdered, uh, we weren't sure who was involved. There was nothing definitive on the uh, wire after the bookmaker had been murdered. There was a reference to the fact, but nothing that would indicate to us that Stanford had a belief someone had done it or someone hadn't done it. Investigators are certain the murder is mob-related, but they have no proof. When they speak to Stanford himself, he claims to know nothing. But Stanford strikes back. Five weeks after the murder of John Stanford's bookie and tax collector, Michael Changlini, the Young Turks' number two man, is coming home after a basketball game. Two men armed with shotguns open fire. Somehow, Changlini, his wife and two children, were uninjured in the attack. Investigators recover 12-gauge shotgun shells from the front yard and shotgun pellets from the ceiling of the living room and dining room. Despite the brazen attack on Changlini and his family, he won't cooperate with the detectives. Uh, he wasn't going to say anything. 
they just don't talk to law enforcement. They, they feel they're going to handle it themselves. It's business, okay, it's, and it's none of our business. So you're not going to get anything out of them. The Young Turks' number two boss isn't talking. But the FBI suspects the attack is payback for the murder of John Stanford's bookie. After the bookmaker's uh, murder and then the attempt on Michael Cinglini, we believed that we were going to see uh, an increase in violence. There was going to be a potential mob war. Fearing this, the FBI petitions a federal court to expand the eavesdropping. In the spring of 1992, they get the court order they need. Agents place bugs in seven new locations, including lawyers' private offices, the law library, the television room, and the lunchroom. The new wires immediately start paying off. How we going, huh? Early in May of 1992, FBI cameras catch Stanfer arriving at the law office with his consigliere and Joseph Changlini, brother of the Young Turk second in command. Inside, John Stanfer angrily announces that he knows the Young Turks are looking for him. They want him dead. But Stanford doesn't want a war. He wants to make one last attempt at diplomacy. His first move is to make Joseph Changlini his new underboss. I guess he thought, as a concession to them, he would be able to control them. There's a saying, uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies even closer. This was the way to keep uh, an eye on them. But we fully anticipated that we were going to see an increase in violence. But uh, we were surprised by what did happen. Informants tell the FBI that Stanford invites Joseph Changlini's younger brother, Michael, and the young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, to a secret meeting. Here, Joey and Michael become made members of La Cosa Nostra. You have to swear to uh, place the family before anything else in your life. God, your, per you know, your, your own personal family, your mother, your father, your wife, your children, if the family calls you, you come before them. Now, as made members of La Cosa Nostra, the two young Turks enjoy special privileges. The, the benefits that come with that are that uh, you can conduct your rackets, whatever they may be, without fear of interference from someone who is not a member. The family in a dispute will always decide in your favor if you are a member and the other person is not. A member cannot be killed unless the boss of that family to which he's a member approves. For John Stanford, promoting the Young Turks is his final act of diplomacy. The FBI and the Organized Crime Task Force will keep a vigilant watch to see if Stanford's bold move stops the violence. But agents still need to collect more information about the crime family to shut them down for good. Through an informant, they learn the law office is not the only place where Stanford and his associates are congregating. We found out that uh, Stanfa had opened up a dinette next to another business he owned, which was a food uh, distribution business. And surprisingly, uh, Stanfa actually worked at this place every day. You know, as a John Q. citizen, he would go to work and he actually worked there. You'd see him out there sweeping and uh, cooking and handling stuff. But he was also meeting his uh, family members there and discussing mob business. So the next step, logically, is to attempt to get a Title III bug installed in the dinette so that we can listen to the conversations he's having with uh, these uh, members and uh, associates of the family. Once the microphone is installed inside the dinette, the FBI hears that an angry John Stanfer is still having problems with the Young Turks. He requests a final sit-down with Joey Merlino. Joey Merlino and Michael Changlini pay a visit to Stanford. So is there a problem? 
left at Brown. Why, sure. Gamblers are complaining that the young Turks are not honoring their bets. Can you be more like a Joe? You broke. Merlino assures the boss he'll fix the problem and make good on the debts. Pay the bill. The meeting ends amicably. Perhaps there can be peace within the family. Early in March, FBI surveillance agents observed Joseph Changlini and a waitress opening up the Stanford dinette. It's almost exactly one year after his brother Michael was nearly gunned down at his home. His activities were easy to document. Uh, he was regular. He, uh, he got up in the morning and he went to work. But on this morning, Joseph Changlini's routine takes a terrifying twist. Four men pull up and open fire on Changlini and the waitress, reigniting the bloody war between the old and the new mafia of South Philadelphia. On March 2nd, 1993, in South Philly, underboss Joseph Changlini and a waitress open John Stanford's diner. Shortly after 6.30 a.m., four gunmen launch an attack. Changlini is gunned down. The surveillance agent alerts FBI HQ and calls 911 for an ambulance. The FBI agent on surveillance arrives on the scene. Joseph Changlini has been shot repeatedly in the head, neck, and chest. The waitress is unharmed. Changlini has somehow managed to survive the deadly attack. Though severely wounded, he can talk. You couldn't get a statement out of him, and even if he knew who did it, he, he wasn't going to implicate anybody. He was, he was part of the mob, the omerta, the code of silence, and, and uh, they would take care of this on their own. They had to know who they were. He saw them. Uh, we suspected that it was a group from the Young Turks, and, but he basically told us he didn't know anything. Hoping to identify the shooters, FBI agents review the surveillance tapes. But in the early morning darkness, the images are too dark to identify anyone. The uh, video was very grainy, very blurry. It was very hard to uh, identify with any kind of particularity uh, features where you would recognize who actually went in, but you could see four shapes going in. Then you, you go to the uh, audio and you hear uh, screaming, and you hear shots, and then you hear uh, someone yelling, move, move, and then they exit the place and they drive away. Well, that's basically all we had. But you couldn't say with any reasonable certainty who actually went in there and shot okay. Joseph Cinglini. But agents are still surveilling the law office. In the listening post, wiretaps record a chilling conversation between Stanfa and a mob associate. John Stanfa suspects Michael Changlini was behind the attempt to kill his own brother, Joseph, at the restaurant. Yeah, Michael and Joey were on the uh, opposite sides of internal war within the Stanfa family. They were half-brothers, and it didn't make any difference. He wanted to, he thought his brother, Joey, was on the wrong side, and He's going to take him out. For John Stanford, there is only one choice. Eliminate Joey Merlino and the Young Turks. So he starts to recruit uh, his own muscle to send them out and to start stalking these Young Turks and trying to uh, kill Joey Merlino, Michael Cinglini, and the people associated with him. Undercover FBI agents deliver a warning to Merlino and Michael Cinglini. What's going on, fellas? When we're aware of the fact that uh, uh, violence is going to occur or may occur, and we think we know who the violence is going to uh, occur against, we have an obligation to go out and warn them. 
John Stanfa is sending hit teams into the streets with orders to gun down Merlino and Cianglini. The young Turks shrug off the FBI warning. Even though they know their lives are in danger, they refuse to cooperate. The young Turks should have listened to the FBI. A Stanford hit team tracks them down and opens fire in broad daylight. Michael Cianglini is shot in the heart and dies on the street. Joey Merlino is wounded. It is clear to the FBI that John Stanford means business. He's uh, taken up the uh, challenge and he's retaliated with a lot of force. So that's where we are right then and there. We believe that Stanford is responsible for it. Now we have to prove it. Three hours after the shooting, South Philadelphia police officers respond to a burning vehicle. The car matches the description of one seen by witnesses at the shooting. Police run a trace and learn that it was leased to a member of the Stanford crime family. That night, police questioned Phil Coletti and his wife. She tells police she reported the car stolen. Coletti says he has been home all day. The FBI views the couple's alibi with skepticism. Coletti becomes the first suspect in the shooting murder of Michael Cianglini. Several days later, the FBI gets a lead on the second shooter. The FBI had received a call from a, a, a physician who said that he had treated an individual who came in with burns that he felt were rather suspicious. FBI agents find John Vesey at home. He, too, is a known member of the Stanford crime family. Agents ask Vesey what happened to his hand. And he says he had an accident with his barbecue grill. His hand was burned when he spilled lighter fluid. V.C. insists the burn was an accident. and says he knows nothing about the murder of Michael Cianglini and the shooting of Joey Merlino. But when investigators check out the grill, they discover it runs on propane, which conflicts with V.C.'s story that he was using lighter fluid when he burned himself. It aroused our suspicion and kind of uh, pointed us toward Vesey more so than anybody else. The FBI suspects two members of the John Stanford crime family in the murder of Michael Cianglini and the shooting of young Turk boss Joey Merlino. But before the FBI can bring the shooters to justice, Joey Merlino and the young Turks try to get their own revenge. John Stanford is riding in a 1976 Cadillac Seville. He's headed south on the Schuylkill Expressway with his son Joseph and a trusted driver. A van pulls up next to the Cadillac. Two gunmen thrust 9mm machine pistols through portholes cut in the side of the van, and they open fire. A full-scale mafia civil war rages on the streets of Philadelphia. Violence explodes with a brazen rush hour attack on Sicilian mob boss John Stanfa. The gunfire misses John Stanfa, but his son Joseph is hit in the face. Stanfa's driver rams the van, forcing it off the highway. What was really brazen about it was on a highway like that, random shots could have struck and hurt, even killed any, any innocent people who were on there. Investigators have no doubt the attack on Stanford is Joey Merlino's revenge for the murder of Michael Cianglini. It showed you the extent of the uh, violence these people were willing to employ and uh, the grudge they bore against uh, Stanford. Police find Stanford at the hospital. Despite the brazen attack on him and his innocent young son, the Cosa Nostra boss claims he has no idea who tried to kill them. And of course, it's the old, I don't know who would have done this to me. And we don't get anything out of him. 
It is only a matter of time before innocent civilians get caught in the crossfire. And it's time to turn up the heat on the warring mob. Any known Stanford or Merlino associate seen driving around South Philadelphia becomes the subject of a routine traffic stop. Authorities arrest eight mobsters for carrying weapons. They confiscate 380, 45, and 38 caliber semi-automatics. The FBI has no doubt the Young Turks boss ordered the hit on John Stanford, but feds can't prove it. Joey Merlino has to be yanked off the streets. The FBI arrests him for a parole violation of a 1990 armored truck robbery. With Joey Merlino off the streets, it is now time for the FBI to focus its sights on John Stanford's crew. The agents target murder suspect John Vesey. The professional hitman is one of John Stanford's soldiers. But tonight, thanks to a New Jersey firearms violation and the threat of a long jail sentence, Vesey has agreed to wear a wire for the FBI. He was a very tough, tough individual. And he did some construction work as a hired laborer for uh, John Stanford's brother-in-law, who was in construction. And he caught the eye of Stanford, and Stanford and, uh, realized this kid was a tough kid, and he could, you know, he, he intimidated people. Under Stanford, V.C. became a loan collector, an enforcer, and a killer. Now he claims he feels the weight of the murders he committed. All these things, plus the fact that his brother, uh, who really cared for him, was convinced that uh, John was going to go down and never see the light of day, his brother convinced him that he should cooperate. Vesey was made into the family by John Stanfa. And now he wants to get out, alive. You couldn't measure the significance of it. It was, uh, uh, it was like a coup for us that he came on board. Vesey quickly becomes comfortable wearing the wire. He has several meetings, but the conversations don't provide any new evidence against John Stanfa. He's out for a little while. He, I think he met with one or two people, nothing great. He was a little, he was a little down about the fact that he wasn't getting the conversations, you know, he wanted to, he was really into it. We told him, look, don't worry about it. You know, we got a lot of time, we'll do it again till we get it right, you know. It's Friday night now, you know, you've worked long and hard for us, go home. Go home and uh, relax, don't go out, we'll hook up with you again, we'll do it again. Later that night, John Vesey runs out of luck and the FBI's organized crime task force is dealt a crippling blow. In a bloody South Philadelphia mob war, the FBI's number one informant is gunned down by mafia hitmen. And the FBI's best chance at busting up a notorious crime family is shattered. FBI Special Agent Fred Walls is devastated by the news that informant John Vesey has been shot. Well, when you hear that someone's been shot in the head, you think the worst. But against all odds, after three 22 caliber slugs slammed into his skull, John Vesey is still alive. I'm shocked. This guy was shot in the head. He's given an interview. And he proceeds to tell what happened. Earlier that night, after he removed the wire and the FBI agents went home, Vesey ran into John Stanford's underboss and one of his soldiers. They tell him, we've been looking for you. We want to uh, get you started in your own bookmaking operation. We're going to show you how to do it. We're going to go over to this location in South Philadelphia above this meat store. For Vesey, it was just another late night business meeting. He wasn't wearing the wire anymore, and he thought he had nothing to fear. He says he goes up to the room. The maid guy is sitting down with him at a table. 
going over figures, telling him how to take bets, how to write stuff down. The underboss excused himself, he has to go to the bathroom. John Vesey heard the sound of the flushing toilet and the door to the bathroom opening. And then he heard the gunshots. Three 22 caliber slugs impacted John Vesey's skull, but he didn't go down. Vesey turns around, looks at the guy, and says, What the frig are you doing? And of course, the, the shooter now, he's, he's in shock. So he throws the gun down and he pulls out a knife. Well, Vesey takes the knife away from him and cuts him and basically incapacitates him and throws him on the ground. He turns to the uh, other guy, the main guy, who's an older guy, and the guy looks at him and he says, John, John, he said, this has all been a mis mistake. It's a, a misunderstanding. We're gentlemen here. We can settle this. And Vizi says, get out of the way or I'm going to take you down too. And against all odds, John Vesey walks out of the room alive. And uh, that just goes to show you how tough this kid was. I mean, he was tough. And... Uh, the bullets went into the back of his head, and uh, we later found out they had hit the head and come around, okay? I guess the slugs weren't as strong. It was a 22 caliber, cal 22 caliber long rifle slug, and he took three in the head and survived. Two weeks later, ex-mafia hitman John Vesey makes his first appearance before the federal grand jury and testifies against his former crime family. The information he provides is invaluable to the FBI. VC names names and gives the FBI what they need to move against the Philadelphia mob. When the FBI increases the pressure, other mobsters make deals with the prosecutors and become informants for the FBI. And the dominoes begin to fall. On St. Patrick's Day in 1994, 24 suspects are arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. Among those arrested is Frank Martinez. He's found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. Vincent Pagano is also arrested and found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. On the same day, John Stanford is arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. It was a, a nice, clean, easy sweep. We brought the people in, and uh, we were very satisfied with it. Ultimately, 27 people are charged with conspiracy and racketeering under the RICO Act. 24 defendants are either convicted or plead guilty to the charges. I felt pretty good that we did make Philadelphia a little bit safer. Uh, it's, it was my job. Uh, it was my life's work. Um, I thought we did a good job, and I thought the, 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 that we served the citizenry very well with what we did. We took a, a very, very violent group uh, and sent a lot of them to jail for a long, long time. And we made Philadelphia a little safer. On July 9th, 1996, John Stanford is sentenced to five consecutive life terms. He is serving them at the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. In a world where money is everything and life means nothing, a drug gang stalks the streets of Chicago. They are heavily armed, well-funded, and have dangerous international contacts. It will take every weapon in the FBI's arsenal to stop a deadly threat known as the El Rukins.
1980s, the drug trade ravaged Chicago's inner city neighborhoods. Heroin and cocaine sales soared. Violent crime threatened to destroy the community. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As drug profits grew, gangs ruled the streets. One of the most dangerous was called El Rukin. Agents teamed up with state and local police to bring them down, but in the process, uncovered a bizarre and frightening terrorist plot. Chicago, Illinois. In the early 1980s, it is one of the deadliest major cities in America. Powerful drug gangs have transformed the South Side from a neighborhood into a war zone. To combat the rising tide of violence, the FBI forms the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. In Chicago, their prime target is a vicious gang known as the El Rukins. John Podliska is an assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago. The business of the El Rukins was to traffic in narcotics, cocaine and, and heroin, and to control a, a vast area on the south side of Chicago for purposes of selling and distributing those narcotics. They would exact tribute from other people who would uh, want to sell in that area, and they had a reputation and a well-deserved reputation for being one of, if not the most successful and the most violent uh, criminal drug dealing organizations in the Chicago area. In the spring of 1985, several members split from the gang. They try to move in on El Rugen territory. Revenge is swift and deadly. Chicago's south side is gripped by a vicious turf war. As the murder rate climbs, the FBI seems powerless to stop the violence. Then, in May, an informant gives agents a tip. Several members of the El Rukin gang have left Chicago. They are hiding out in a house in Cleveland. Many of them are wanted for murder. FBI agents and Cleveland police raid the house and arrest several suspects. One of them is a man named Anthony Sumner. Sumner is a former El Rukin general, which makes him potentially useful. If investigators can turn him, they can get intelligence on the secret of El Rukin's. Detectives question Sumner for hours. He implicates himself in a double homicide in Chicago and is facing serious time. Authorities offer to reduce charges, but only if Sumner tells them everything he knows about the El Rukins. Finally, the former El Rukin general agrees to cooperate. As Sumner talks to authorities, a terrifying picture emerges. The El Rukin gang has hundreds of members. They're heavily armed, they're well organized, and they're growing. The entire organization is run by Jeff Fort, a kingpin known for his efficiency and his brutality. He was at the top controlling the entire organization, directly below him were 21 generals, and he preserved his power that way. If anyone tried to seize power from him, from amongst those 21 generals, there were 20 other people who would be in a position to let him know that, and he could retaliate. Authorities thought they had taken Ford out of commission. In 1983, he was convicted of cocaine trafficking and sentenced to 13 years in a Texas prison. According to Sumner, Jeff Fort continues to run the El Rukins. 
He uses the prison pay phones to contact his gang in Chicago. Sumner's statement is a major break in the El Rukin case, according to Assistant U.S. Attorney Patrick Deedy. He was the first person to actually confirm what uh, the authorities had thought for a long time, which was that Jeff Ford, who was currently in penitentiary in Texas, was regularly talking on the telephone to members of the El Rukins in Chicago and coordinating or directing activities of the organization. The El Rukins run their operation out of a converted movie theater on the south side of Chicago. It had been fortified by the El Rukins and was essentially a, a, a fortified fortress. He had people at the headquarters of the El Rukins who were required to sit by that phone 24 hours a day. There was always someone at the phone so that when he called, he could give his instructions, directions, and orders as to what he wanted done with his organization. For the task force, Jeff Fort's telephone conversations are an opportunity to learn more about the organization. Yes, Imam. No one questioned what he said and what he wanted done. There was absolutely no uh, debate, discussion, objection to anything that he was saying. And so the FBI over the summer 1985 began to develop evidence uh, to provide a sufficient probable cause to go and to begin to listen to the, these conversations. Agents activate a 24-hour wiretap to record the Kingpin's phone calls. Tom Corum is a former special agent with the FBI. In 1985, he is assigned to the Drug Task Force and the El Rukin case. The technicians installed the wiretap equipment through the telephone company. Nothing was actually installed at the prison. We did all of our monitoring, in fact, in Austin, Texas, which was 40 to 50 miles away from Bastrop, Texas, where the prison was located. We were really stunned uh, when we started hearing the conversation from Fort because he, w he was speaking with, with key gang leaders in Chicago, and what we were hearing was just strings of words. Jeff Fort and his gang are talking in code and the kinds of, of series of words that we would hear said would be things like, uh, in the science of taku, love, truth, perfect man. Uh, and we had, we, didn't, we had no idea what, uh, what these words meant. And uh, we couldn't establish any form of reference to figure out what he was saying during these conversations. Agents believe that Fort and the El Rukans are discussing drug deals. But until they crack the gang's code, they can't prove a thing. One of the Chicago police officers came up with really a, a very good idea. The Chicago Police Department had uniformed officers almost on a daily basis make some sort of contact with the El Rukin gang members just to let them know that the Chicago Police Department was in the neighborhood and that they were being watched. And so the Chicago detective came up with the idea of having one of the uniformed officers go up to the gang headquarters, speak to one of the gang leaders while Jeff Fort was on the telephone and see if the gang members would encode what the police officer had said to the gang member and then feed it back to Jeff Fort in the coded form. And what we heard was the gang member come back up to the telephone where Jeff Fort was on the phone at the time and then encode that statement that had been made to him by the police officer. So at that point, we, we, learned, we learned the code words for one, the word for pound, and the word for marijuana. And the word for marijuana, we found out uh, at that time, was perfect man. Breaking the El Rukin code is slow, painstaking work. After two months, agents only know a fraction of the gang's business. 
we realized that we were missing a lot of the calls that were being made from other phones at uh, the El Rukin headquarters in Chicago. So we knew that the operation that we were running in Texas uh, needed to be concluded and we needed to set operations back up in Chicago and begin monitoring all of the phones inside the gang headquarters in order to, to get the whole story. In December, Agent Corum and his team decide to move the wiretap operation to Chicago. They establish a new listening post near El Rukin headquarters. As authorities activate the new wiretap, they encounter a familiar problem. When we turned the wire on in Chicago, I found that once again I was hearing words that I didn't understand. The El Rukin gang is using a new code. They may have found out the FBI was listening. Once again, Agent Corum can't understand what they're saying. It was like we had to start all over again when I thought we would be able to start to uh, pick up where we left off when we shut the operation down in Texas. Hour after hour, Corum listens to the recordings. He slowly pieces together phrases. Something is different. Something has changed. Some of the words I started picking up were words like up, up. Uh, I started hearing words that related to travel, and there hadn't been any words that related to travel during the, during the, the Texas operation. I started hearing references to New York, and I eventually heard a reference to Libya that really caused me to be really, really concerned about what changes had occurred during the three or four months that we had not been monitoring the telephones. It's a chilling discovery. Libya, a rogue nation in North Africa, is suspected of state-sponsored terrorism. A well-armed drug gang combined with foreign terrorists could pose a deadly threat to national security. In Chicago, an FBI wiretap reveals that Jeff Fort continues to run the El Rukin gang from prison. Bring it all back to me. Although the gang talks in code, authorities learn they are discussing Libya, a country suspected of terrorism. Investigators of the Chicago Drug Task Force spend hours listening to the recorded conversations. To Special Agent Tom Corum, it doesn't make sense why is a Chicago drug gang talking about Libya? I went back to the beginning and started listening to the conversations again, and I started piecing the bits and pieces of the conversation together and came to the conclusion that, uh, that they were talking about having met with someone in Libya who was going to provide them with money for destroying an airplane uh, here in the United States. Corum alerts the U.S. Attorney's Office. The drug investigation has uncovered a potential terrorist plot. The FBI calls in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Special Agent Ned Hamara is assigned to the Terrorism Task Force in Chicago. We took it seriously because uh, we had no idea whether it was real or not. It was decided that the Terrorism Task Force take over the, the wire and continue an investigation and determine uh, what, if anything, was going on. The Drug Task Force offered their agents to help with uh, overhearing the wire talk uh, and uh, recorded conversations. If authorities hope to unravel El Rukin's plans, they need to decipher the new code quickly and completely. This is a conversation. At that time, we took our surveillance teams and put them to work. Fred Wheat is a lieutenant with the Chicago Police Department. His specialty is surveillance. In 1985, Wheat is assigned to the FBI's terrorism task force. We were brought in because they knew that they would need surveillance and also that uh, a number of the Chicago police officers had worked El Rukens before and would be helpful in, in, in setting up the strategy to work this organization. 
The surveillance team's job is to make physical observations that can be compared to the information agents are hearing on the wiretap. We basically had round-the-clock surveillance uh, on different members of the group who were involved with the conversations with Jeff Fort. We were watching those members and just trying to follow their activities. On one instance, one of the gang members reads a newspaper article to Jeff Fort and substitute the code word for the actual newsprint. So, I mean, we had a verbatim interpretation of some of those code words because he describes uh, an incident on the south side of Chicago where uh, there was a shooting involving a landlord and a neighbor of some sort. And so we were able to take those code words and go back to previous conversations, insert them into conversations, which solved a lot of our deciphering of some coded conversations. Okay, and that's it. Slowly, agents crack the new code. Ron Reddy is a special agent with the FBI's Chicago field office. The calls that are being intercepted at the El Rukin uh, headquarters basically concern two areas. They concern the El Rukin's normal business of uh, engaging in drug transactions, as well as well, what we are beginning to realize is a uh, plot between the El Rukins and the government of Libya. How'd it go? Knowing the violent history of this particular organization, we were afraid that the El Rukins were going to commit an act of terrorism in the United States in order to obtain money from the Libyan government. From the wiretap, authorities learned that several members of the El Rukin gang recently traveled to Libya. As agents continue to monitor the gang's conversations, the situation with Libya deteriorates. On April 2nd, 1986, a bomb detonates aboard TWA Flight 840 between Rome and Athens. Four Americans are killed. Nine are injured. The FBI suspects the government of Libya and President Muammar Gaddafi are responsible for the carnage. On April 4th of 1986, there was a series of conversations between Jeff Fort and a yes. general in the El Rukin organization known as yes. Melvin Mays. And they discussed this explosion on this flight between Rome and Greece. And Mays, at one point in the conversation, indicates that their group would be able to do something like that within 30 to 50 days. Yeah. It is a terrifying prospect. I want you to take a video. Via the decoded wiretap, the task force listens in on Fort's plans. The gang leader wants two of his generals, Leon McAnderson and Rico Cranshaw, to make another trip to Libya. Fort was really concerned about how are we going to convince the Libyans, you know, that we're an organization that can do something for them. One of the things that we were able to determine, he talked about getting uh, newspaper clippings to take back over there to show uh, the Libyans that uh, this is what we've been doing, this is what we can do. It's, you know, violent things that happen in, that the Arukans are responsible for. The whole idea was to convince the Libyans that the Al Rukans were an organization uh, big enough to uh, commit some significant terrorist activity or acts in the United States on their behalf. We believed it was a real threat. If McAnderson and Cranshaw return to Libya, federal agents will not be far behind. In Chicago, FBI agents and police wiretap the El Rukin gang. Two of Jeff Fort's generals are planning a trip overseas to convince Libyan officials that El Rukin can perform terrorist acts within the United States. Travel restrictions to Libya make the trip impossible. Ron Reddy is a special agent with the FBI assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. 
the United States had just engaged in at least two military actions against the Libyans, and the El Rukans knew that the Libyans were under scrutiny from the United States government. The El Rukans, as well as the Libyans, felt that the safest place for them to meet would be in Panama, which they called the Straw Hat. That was their particular code word for Panama. Cranshaw and McAnderson, two high-ranking El Rukan generals, will make the trip to Panama City. The task force needs surveillance on both men from the moment they leave Chicago until they return. On May 3rd, Cranshaw and McAnderson leave El Rukan headquarters. A surveillance team is not far behind. The El Rukans board a jet in Chicago, bound for Miami. From there, they fly to Panama. In Panama, Cranshaw and McAnderson are seen entering the Libyan embassy, presumably to meet with government officials. And on May 10th, the two El Rukans returned to the United States. We knew when they were coming back, and we worked with our colleagues at U.S. Customs and asked them to do a, a search of these individuals as the, when they arrived in Miami. They found a document in Rico Crenshaw's luggage, which they photographed. Uh, uh, Crenshaw and McAnderson were not uh, aware that this was happening, um, but the document was in Crenshaw's handwriting. Basically, they had written a letter that said that they had five man cells in cities throughout the United States and that they were interested in trying to destabilize the government. The next day, on May 11th, the task force intercepts several telephone conversations between the two El Rukans and their leader, Jeff Fort. Cranshaw and McAnderson tell Fort the Libyans have agreed to provide financing. They will deposit the money in a Panamanian bank in the United States. An attorney they met in Panama will contact them shortly. For the task force, it's a terrifying development. But agents don't have enough evidence to prosecute the El Rukan gang on conspiracy charges. In order for the FBI to establish that a crime has been committed, we must collect enough evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the conspiracy had actually taken place and that there was an intended goal of the conspiracy. And we had to prove that there was a serious plan to commit an act of terrorism here in the United States. Agents continue to listen to the wiretap, hoping to learn more. During June, Fort talks about sending El Rukans over to Libya to learn bomb-making skills. Uh, he said, we can send some of the soldiers or members over there. They could learn how to make bombs. Those individuals can come back to the United States and teach other members how to make bombs. As alarming as this scenario is, it's still not enough to prove a conspiracy. Weeks go by. The money from the Libyans never shows up. Fort panics. He will do anything to make the deal. In late June, early July, Fort became, uh, well, he just saw that the money was not going to be coming from the Libyans and that he had to do something, or the Arukans had to do something to show the Libyans you know, that they were somebody to respect. He talked about damaging a government building. He talked about planting bombs. He talked about uh, blowing up an airplane. 
and he talked about getting a rocket, that one that you can use once and throw away. So we figured, okay, how can we address this issue? Through the wiretaps, we're here. Fort wants to buy military-grade weapons. The task force decides to use it to their advantage by becoming El Rukin's sole supplier. So enter Special Agent Willie Hulon. Willie was on the drug task force. He had already made one drug buy with Alan Knox through an FBI cooperating source. Alan Knox is a high-ranking El Rukin. Agents assume he is aware of Fort's plans. So we figured that we'd set up another drug buy with Alan Knox, and at which point Special Agent Hulon could introduce the idea that uh, he had a weapons contact and so on, and that they could, might be able to supply the El Rukins or somebody else with weapons or, or any military equipment. He mentions that he has a friend who works at a military base, a friend who can steal weapons. Knox is interested. Willie Hulon is an amazing individual. Uh, he's cool, calm, collected, uh, works well under pressure. He was ideal for this situation. Uh, his, his knowledge of the street gangs, his, his calmness and operating sources, and Willie was perfect for this role. Knox tells Hulon about the kind of weapons the gang wants to buy. They were interested in grenade launchers. And so when he described the grenade launchers, he said it's the type that Clint Eastwood used in the movie, which obviously is a law rocket. The M72 law rocket is the U.S. Army's primary light anti-tank weapon. The shoulder-launched missile can penetrate a foot of armor at a range of over 200 meters. It can destroy a tank, a building, or even a low-flying airliner. Agents cannot allow El Rukin to obtain such a deadly weapon on the open market. But the development does offer unique opportunities. We decided that why not we supply, or the FBI supply, uh, the El Rukins with a rocket. Special Agent Willie Hulon negotiates with Alan Knox on the price. He tells Knox he can get law rockets for $1,850 a piece. Obviously, uh, we weren't going to sell these guys a law rocket that they could use or would even work. But that being said, we wanted to sell them a, a device that looked like a real law rocket and on a cursory inspection would appear to them to be a real law rocket. And they will buy for that 2200 The ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, constructs a dummy law rocket. Although it looks like the real thing, it does not contain an explosive charge. The ATF also installs a radio transmitter so agents can track the device from a distance. The inert rocket is ready. The trap is set. On July 29th, the task force launches the operation. On July 29, 1986, the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force launches a complex sting operation. Agents will attempt to sell a dummy law rocket to the El Rukins, a gang of vicious drug dealers who are willing to sell out their own country to Libyan terrorists. Gang leader Jeff Fort takes the bait. He tells Alan Knox to set up the buy. And we're hearing this on the wiretap after the meeting, you know, so we know that it's going to go forward. The arrangements which were basically given to us by the Arukans was we were going to meet them where the transaction was going to occur. The task force 
task force meets to plan the sting operation. The sale of the law rocket will go down at a hotel in Lansing, Illinois, 30 miles from Chicago. Normally, we would have never conducted uh, an undercover investigation like this because of the extreme danger to uh, Agent Hulon, but the fact that we knew that the Al Rukans were dealing with the Libyans, we had to weigh those risks and ultimately decided that we could do it safely, that we could make the transaction safely and protect the life of our undercover agent. Surveillance teams will form the outer perimeter, four blocks from the hotel. SWAT and undercover teams will form an inner perimeter stationed in and around the hotel. On July 31st, agents from the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, and the Chicago Police Department deploy to the hotel in Lansing, Illinois. They cannot fail. The lives of hundreds and possibly thousands of people are at stake. On the night of the Law Rocket deal, we probably had in excess of 50 individuals spread out through, through different areas. Surveillance teams assigned to the outer perimeter get into position. At 6.30 p.m., a car enters the perimeter. There are two men inside. Agents are unable to identify either one of them. Detective Wheat's surveillance team picks up the incoming vehicle. He follows it to a gas station nearby. At the gas station, Wheat is able to make a positive ID. Melvin Mays is the driver. Alan Knox is in the passenger seat. Moments after Melvin had departed the gas station, we saw him go in toward the inner perimeter. We passed on the plate number of the vehicle, the color of the vehicle, the make of the vehicle, all pertinent information that would help us keep this, this vehicle under surveillance. At the hotel, task force members get into position. We had a, a complement of SWAT other surveillance people, other uh, case agents uh, in uh, adjacent rooms, down hallways, uh, different floors, everything to control that situation. We didn't want people from another floor coming up. We didn't want to have citizens who weren't a part of this deal uh, getting caught in the crossfire if that happened. the outer teams were prepared to move in to help secure this area in the event that things went wrong so that it was plenty of uh, firepower there on hand to deal with any situation that might develop. Mays and Knox arrive at the hotel within minutes. The sale is about to go down. The task force is ready. They know the El Rukans are willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill Jeff Ford's orders and make the buy. On the night of July 31st, 1986, two members of the El Rukan gang arrive at a hotel in Lansing, Illinois. They have arranged to purchase a light anti-tank rocket. Their goal, to prove to the Libyan government that the El Rukans can operate as terrorists for hire. They have no idea that the man they are dealing with is an undercover FBI agent. Members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force can hear every word of the transaction. Detective Fred Wheat and his surveillance team is stationed four blocks from the hotel. We heard a knock on the door. We could actually hear the physical knock. We heard some voices and someone asked who it was, et cetera. He was admitted into the room. We could hear them negotiate or talk about the sale of the rocket. The 
to launch. A little something extra I threw in. Can't see the rocket launcher. Where's that? Fun photo. You know I don't do business like that. Where's the cash? It's close. I'll get your launcher when I get my cash. A few minutes later, Melvin Mays leaves the hotel. He needs to get final confirmation from gang leader Jeff Fort before the sale can be completed. Mays returns to El Rukin headquarters to wait for Fort's call. Jeff Fort controlled every aspect of the El Rukin organization to include this transaction. The wiretap picks up the phone call between Mays and Jeff Fort. Fort seems leery about the buy. He's worried that it's a setup. Fort instructs Mays to bring a young gang member back with him. They should arrive at the hotel in separate cars. If the buy is a setup, Jeff Fort would rather sacrifice a low-level gang member than risk one of his generals. In other words, Fort did not want any contact or any trading of money between the undercover agents who he suspected and his generals. Fort orders him to deliver the money to the hotel and then pick up the law rocket. The sale goes off without a hitch. have no idea that the law rocket is a dummy. The low-level El Rukin takes off in the direction of Chicago. Surveillance units follow him onto the Dan Ryan Expressway. At that point, we had surveillance behind them, in front of them, on the side of them, down the expressway, coming on at certain exits, getting off at certain exits. Suddenly, the young gang member transporting the law rocket pulls over and stops. Seconds later, another vehicle pulls alongside him. It's Melvin Mays. What are you doing? As it turns out, the gang member's car has broken down. The law rocket is transferred to Mays' car. We would not have known that it changed from one vehicle to the other or one person to the other unless we had a physical eye on that uh, transaction. The law rocket had been equipped with a radio transmitter and we were using electronic equipment and physical surveillance to follow the rocket back to where they eventually stored it. 
Mays drives to an apartment building on South Kenwood Avenue, a few miles from El Rukin headquarters. The gang members refer to this building as the armory. Then our job really began because at that point we were 24-7 on that location because we had to make sure that that law rocket was not moved. Special Agent Ned Hamara continues to monitor the wiretap. A couple days went by, Fort's uh, fears were allayed that they weren't police, and in subsequent conversations, he says, okay, let's buy five more. You know, we want five more, and we're gonna test one. Task force members are worried. Fort has chosen a target to prove his terrorist capabilities. He intends to kill a Chicago police detective. The detective who was kind of, he, he worked for the gang crime Chicago Police Department, who was kind of a thorn for many years in the Orukan side. They hated him and they figured, okay, we're gonna buy some rockets, but we're gonna use one and we're gonna test it on him. Gentlemen, according to the wiretap. The attorneys and the agents all made the decision, okay, let's take it down now. Let's not wait any further, because we figured if they tried to test the law rocket, they're going to determine that it's a dummy rocket and it's going to blow a lot of people's cover. The FBI makes a dangerous call. It's time to take down the El Rukin gang and put Jeff Fort behind bars forever. The FBI has the El Rukin gang on the hook. They have surveillance photos and wiretaps of the gang purchasing a dummy law rocket. From his prison in Texas, gang leader Jeff Fort instructs the El Rukans to buy five more rockets. He wants to test fire one of them to prove that his gang can perform terrorist hits for hire. We had to prevent the Arukans from actually doing something to try to impress the Libyans. Uh, we felt it prudent at that time that we'd gone along far enough, we had enough evidence to at least put them behind bars for at least weapon charges, if not uh, the terrorist activities. We weren't going to take the chances that they were going to get a law rocket from an outside source and use it. A live law rocket in the hands of a violent gang like the El Rukans would be catastrophic. I think everybody decided it was time to uh, take it down. On the morning of August 5th, the task force launches simultaneous raids on El Rukan headquarters and on the apartment building they call the Armory. That building at 39th and Drexel was a fortified fort. It had steel doors on both the front and rear and iron gates across the other doors. We had to use a, a burning bar that day to gain entry into the fort to execute our search warrant. Go, 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 go! We went from surveillance officers to search and uh, control officers. We began systematically arresting across the uh, city all individuals that were involved in this plot. In an office at El Rukin headquarters, authorities find travel itineraries to Libya for Rico Cranshaw and Leon McCanderson. The second arrest team raids the apartment building on South Kenwood Avenue. I was at the location on South Kenwood. Our main objective was to find the law rock. We're walking all through the complex, you know, behind the, the ATF agent who's got the beacon and he's going upstairs and downstairs and all around, oh, it's getting fader, we're getting stronger. 
we were in there for, you know, it seemed like a half hour, and we're walking, and we're still can't, not getting it. And finally, we go down into the basement, and this is a rat-infested, roach-infested location. But when we're going down the stairs, it gets louder and louder and louder. Finally, we decided it's got to be under the stairwell. So we ripped open the stairwell, and sure enough, the law rock was there, along with about 35 other uh, assortment of automatic uh, weapons that we discovered. Some of them were submachine guns. Uh, who knows you know, how many weapons were used in crimes or murders or what. The main thing, we got the law rocket back before they were able to determine what, that it you know, was an inert or a dummy law rocket. McAnderson and Cranshaw are arrested without incident. Alan Knox is also taken into custody. Melvin Mays is nowhere to be found. On October 30th, 1986, Jeff Fort, Alan Knox, Rico Cranshaw, and Leon McAnderson are indicted on charges of conspiracy, possession of weapons, and use of interstate facilities to carry on unlawful activities. Melvin Mays, who is still a fugitive, is placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. In 1987, McAnderson and Cranshaw are convicted and sentenced to more than 50 years in prison. Melvin Mays eludes authorities for nearly nine years. In 1995, he is arrested and convicted and sentenced to three life terms in prison. Jeff Fort, who is already incarcerated, is sentenced to spend an additional 80 years in prison. This was the first instance in the United States history that American citizens had been convicted for attempting to commit a terrorist act for a foreign government. For Chicago police, the El Rukin case is a major victory. A dangerous street gang has been destroyed. For the FBI, the El Rukin case is a battle won in the ongoing war against terrorism.